Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas. Today is part two of Teddy sharing stories about boxing legend and his longtime mentor, Customato. If you missed part one of this series, please be sure to check that out first. And now, without further ado, part two. Um, he loved food, coveted food. You know, he he always talked about, you know, being Italian and food was food was important and even when they didn't have money the, his father always made sure they had food somehow made sure they had enough food food was important food you know if you had food you were okay no matter no matter what your status on the totem pole of life was as long as you had food you were doing all right so it was he was always afraid of not having enough that's like a, a byproduct, I think, of anyone who spent time during the Great Depression. Because my grandmother was like that. She wasn't a huge foodie, per se, but same way. Food was like, as long as you had the food, we're good. Without the food, there was a problem. But that, And, and she would tell stories about growing up in the Depression and how they'd eat a can of uh, t- tomatoes and um, putting water in the ketchup to stretch it. Well, because food was, you know, was very important. And he... He discovered a like for tuna fish. Mm-hmm. He he was funny, cuss, because he grew up a different way, you know, a rough way, and you know, f- uh, he grew up in a whole different way in the toughest sport or toughest business in the world, or well, one of them. And you know, he, and then all of a sudden, uh, he discovered things. I remember he used to tell me, Teddy, I discovered a few years ago. Tuna fish and mayonnaise. I said, "Oh, really? I'm ahead of you, cuss." You know, because <laughs> I, I, I got that. I got that oh, quite a while ago. You know, and another thing: yeah. ham sandwich with mayonnaise. Did you ever <laughs> have it? I said, "Yeah, it's, it's good, isn't it?" Said, yeah. So he was discovering these things, like being that he was, he was in isolation. You know, he was like. Yeah. Really, because he was up there, he would stay in his. Not, sometimes he'd stay in his, in his robe, a plaid robe, to like, all day long, you know. So, yeah. so he, he was, he was in isolation. I mean, there's a guy that I described it fair, that he was before I got up there. There wasn't a lot going on, you know. He would go to the gym for a couple of hours a day, and that was it, you know, with maybe two fighters, one fighter, and. Now it was now it was changing, and he was coming out of it a little. But he was still. There's a guy who was in retreat, I think, and so now here he is. So the the packages would come in, and one of us would take Camille shopping, and we come in and uh, load up our old Dodge station wagon, and we we unload the back. And if you, God forbid. You weren't familiar with the cold, <laughs> with, with the you know what I mean, Ken? Yeah, yeah. The cold. Uh, you you were a newcomer in the house, and you tried to oh here let me grab, put that down. I put the groceries away. <laughs> I have a certain system. They got to be put away a certain way. They got to be in the pantry. The to, to the fish on the left labels out. <laughs> you know, I got to count them. I got to know how many we got. I got to have the, the the this on this other show, you know, whatever. He had it organized. Yeah. He was organized. All right. And what about that? No, nope! that's mayonnaise. I got to count the jars of mayonnaise. Camille, you're two jars short on mayonnaise. Cuss, we got enough mayonnaise. No, you don't. We got 27 cans of tuna and we only got six bottles of mayonnaise. What are we going to do? We run out of mayonnaise. <laughs> Go to the store. I don't know. I mean, go 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 to the mattresses, <laughs> get the guns. <laughs> I, I mean, we might, you know, remember the remember the the Godfather. Well, you know, Sonny's going crazy. We might have to go to the mattresses too. Yep. We might have to go. To, <laughs> Cuts is going crazy with the two. We might have to go to the mattresses. <laughs> we might have to go to the mattresses. If you would joke about that, would he would he be able to laugh about it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, no, he wouldn't laugh. He would just say, you know, something like, uh, "Yeah, you know, I'm get it, I'm in charge here." You know, <laughs> it's it's not funny. All right, 
<laughs> it's not funny. Okay, gotcha. You know, whatever. I mean, but, but you know, it was it was what it was. And uh, he was in charge. And was, all right, back up, back up. You know, tuna fish. <laughs> uh, you know, and so yeah, and he, you know, he would put everything, put it down. I got it. I got it. Put it down. <laughs> okay, and he would, you know, he get everything sorted out, and have it all and, and listen he had his own system because cuz didn't make one can of tuna can i told you this food situation he'd make five yeah six in a big bowl you know and he had his system he had the lemon he had the onions you know he had the celery you know he had it all figured out push it all in there you know and then you had to have the mayonnaise God forbid you empty six cans of tuna into a bowl with onion, <laughs> celery, lemon, and there ain't no mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Once, this, once he mixed it all up, was it like free for all? Anyone could have some? Or did he dole it out? Or was it just his? No, it was his. Okay. It was his. If you were, if you were on a good side, and I was, I trained his fighters, you might get a sandwich. Yeah. There might be a sandwich in the in your future. <laughs> you know? There, there might be. And he wanted he wanted to keep low on the carbs. So he would only take one piece of bread and put it on top and open it as eat it as an open sandwich. Yeah. So you cut down <laughs> the bread. Yeah. You know? You have to same but he would pound the tuna up high. I gotcha. Okay. <laughs> when w what was dinner like? Would 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 Camille do the cooking or would Cus do the cooking? Oh, Camille did the cooking. So when she would put out food, was it like any any eccentricities around like dining and like? Would, I'm assuming it was all family style with all the people yeah. that were there. Yeah, it was. I mean, she make different things. If you know, every once in a while, maybe once every <coughs> two weeks, she makes spaghetti and meatballs. Forget it. You you you. you you think it was, uh, you know, it was a centennial. <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, I mean, uh, every cut say, hey, hey, come to me. Don't get home from the gym late. We're having spaghetti and meatballs today. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Don't let everybody know. Don't pass it around. I'm just telling you, you're my guy. <laughs> We're having spaghetti and meatballs. Get home early. Get at the table. We'll get our seats. All right, we'll probably wind up with a couple extra meatballs. All right, <laughs> I mean it was a big, big, big deal. And listen, you want to hear something crazy? I mean, and this is—I hope it's not being making fun because if it is, then it, it's not what I want it to be. But yeah. I'm saying that he's an eccentric man. Geniuses are eccentric. And living alone like he was with Camille all those years, nobody up there, basically to me and Kevin came up, you know? And it changed. Yeah. Everything changed. But he was a special man. But, yeah, he there was I, – I hope it doesn't come across as belittling because that would break my heart. Yeah. Um, And that's why I'm slowing down a minute and saying to myself right now, is it coming across that way? Um. Yeah, I know it's funny. Uh, it's eccentric. Uh, but he he earned the right to be eccentric. Yeah, you know where I don't feel like it's making fun of him because I love him. I can't make fun of him, so I feel that I feel that it just pronounces his greatness more that. Only somebody great, you would spend this much time talking about such things. Yeah, Is that, that's very fair. You know what I mean? Yeah. Only someone this great would you spend that much time, you know. Yeah, I mean, you got a guy like Yogi Berra, maybe the the greatest bad ball hitter of all time. Uh, won all those world titles with the Yankees. One of the greatest catchers of all time. And he's known for yoga, yogiisms. Yeah, you know, for all these, you know, you get to a fork in the road. What do you do? Take it, take it. <laughs> <laughs> Am I making fun of Yogi right now? You, you know what I mean? No, I'm not. I'm not. You get to a fork in the road. Take it. I'm not making fun of him, but 
I'm talking about him in reverence. Yeah. I'm talking about him in a special way because he was so special that those kind of, you know, items that would be kooky with somebody else just in some ways establishes more how special he is that we remember such things where we wouldn't remember that if someone else said it. Yeah. Well, it's funny, as you're telling these, I'm just thinking about all the little things that you've picked up from him along the way. If you remember when we were in Philadelphia, we'd get, I'd go and get cases of water at the, at the Target, which was across the street. And if that, if that pile of water, now, when I say water for the people listening, there was a mountain of water, a cases, like it looked like we were selling water. It was so much water in the apartment. And if it got down below two or three cases, I just remember saying to Chris, who was the strength coach, I'm like, oh, shit. I go, dude, there's only two or three cases. He's like, yeah, there's 24 bottles in a case. I go, if Teddy comes in and sees there's only two cases of water, I'm going to have to leave and go to Target immediately. I go, I'm just going. And I would get 20 cases of water. The people at Target, they'd see me there all the time and be like, dude, what are you guys doing with all this water? I said, well, we're drinking it. Please, just just help me get it into the car. We, that would be like my you know, bi-weekly I, I job. I wanted to make by- sure that my fighter... <laughs> Never was in a situation where he went four hours without drinking because you could get you could get lazy and satisfied and say, I don't, you know, you don't feel thirsty. So, but when you have an athlete getting ready for a twelve round title fight against you know such a tremendous opponent, uh, and you're training every day, you want to make sure that an enormous, uh, an adequate, but it's enormous, an adequate amount of water is being drank. Oh, I know why you were doing it. It was justified. No, no, justified. I know, you, you know, but I'm just saying. So, yeah, that some of that passed on to me that I never wanted to get to the point where maybe we, we were short on water and maybe he wound up going six, seven hours without water because it it just, be, we, we allowed that to fall through the cracks a little. That's all. But yeah, yeah I was yeah, yeah. ahead of it. You're right. I was, uh, <laughs> I was, I was, I was like Noah. I was, uh, <laughs> I was, I was the Aquaman uh, before <laughs> Aquaman ever got hit the big screens. Uh, yeah, no doubt about that. The only thing we had more than water, I think, was um, tape and uh, boxing supplies. Yes, <laughs> true. You're right. And you were great. You helped me a lot. And. I mean, cause I remember, like, if we had company, cuz didn't want to be. It wasn't about being embarrassed. Again, it was about embarrassed, maybe, but it was about some things never leave you as a kid, and it's about not wanting to be short with food for other people. That was the way that Cuss's family, they they could be poor. He told me, but if if a if a kid came to the door that was a friend of theirs, they brought some body to the door. They'd find the food. Yeah, they they would they would invite them over. They would never say no 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 no, don't 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 invite your two friends over. We don't have enough. No, invite them over. We're gonna we're, we're feed them. Uh, that was important. Uh, that that you extended yourself to people, and the best way for them to they couldn't do it by by say come on a hot day come swim in our swimming pool but you can have a meal yeah that was our way of showing that we could give something and care about somebody uh and help somebody so when guests would come over cuss would go around and i remember this one particular day camille made chicken wings but they were big they weren't the little chicken wings they were big ones i mean you know like big and it almost like chicken breasts. And so he goes, he opens up the oven. He goes, how many chicken wings? And we had guests coming over. He goes, how many chicken wings? She says, I don't know. I don't count how many chicken wings. It's enough. He goes, well, I count it. And by my calculation, if <laughs> if each person eats five chicken wings, she stopped him. She said, because nobody eats five this size chicken breast or wings, whatever they yeah. want. Well, I do. So if everybody <laughs> eats five, we're going to be seven short. 
because he he added like we had five people you need 25 or, or we had maybe eight people you know so you needed 40 so so she was like I'm not cooking 40 chicken breast or whatever they were I'm not well we got to do something <laughs> because people are going to be short <laughs> because if everyone eats four we're going to owe five whatever we're going to be short so come on Teddy Come on. All right, cuz. <laughs> Where are we going? Get chicken legs, chicken wings, chicken. <laughs> what are we doing? They didn't have Popeyes back then. What, what are we yeah. doing? Hey, come on. We're going across the way. We walk across 10 acres of land. We walk across the way to the carriage house. They rented out the carriage house where the garage was. It was an old carriage house where it used to be a horse stable. We go across, and what did cuz have there? Take a guess. A refrigerator. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't make you an amazing Crespin, but yeah, yeah, you win. <laughs> Jeopardy, you, 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 you'd be doing good. So he goes, come on, come on. So you go, he's got a freezer. He's got meats just in case, God forbid, you know, like, or, or whatever, or maybe somebody dropped a bomb, you know, God forbid. Like a strategic oil reserve. We're going to be good for a while. So he opens up the freezer. I look in there. I say, oh, whoa. You know, he's got everything. Oh, and of course, immaculately stacked, meticulously stacked, you know, steaks, you know, just that. And he's looking through. What do I got? All right, grab that, Teddy. What does that? Kabasi. Come on. We, uh, so he threw a kabasi in the oven just in case the chicken <laughs> ran out. We had a kabasi in there, too. You ever yeah. tried chicken and kabasi? It's an interesting match. So it's, it's an interesting match. I don't suggest it, but it's <laughs> but it's <laughs> it's an it's an interesting match. So look, that was part of the greatness, the the life with the great. Tell me, about, tell me about the first time Tyson came over and had dinner with oh you guys because the way. I the way I understood it, he was, you, you guys were trying to be, he was a ward of the state, and for you, for him Not to yet. live with Cuss, he had to spend a night. Yeah, well, I had been training him once a week ever since the first day he was brought there by Bobby Stewart, the correction officer, former pro fighter, pro, former amateur champion. Uh, ever since the first day he was brought over to us, uh, we made arrangements that he was going to live with us when he got released paroled, finished his time up in Tryon, you know, juvenile detention center, basically. And I was about 30 miles outside of Albany. So he was going to live with us because he was making arrangements. So part of, the, part of the deal was that the state said that he had to, as you said, spend the night with us and see how that went. So when that day came, and I was training him once a week because Cuz didn't want to wait till he got paroled, which was going to take a few months. So every Monday, I think it was every Monday, uh, Bobby Stewart would drive him in a prison van to the gym where I would train him for an hour and a half, two hours. So he could then go back to try on and practice the things I had taught him for the week and then come back. This way, by the time he finally got released, we already had a jump start on his teaching. So now he's got to come, and like I said, part of the requirement was he had to spend a day with us, a night and a day with us. So comes here he is. So he's he's on audition. He's trying to be, you know, he's trying to be on his best behavior. Too much. It was fake. But, you know, he's a kid. Uh, what are you going to do? He's a kid. He's trying to impress. He doesn't want to screw this up. Yeah. He wants to make sure when his time comes, he's living with us. And he's being trained by us. So, uh, you can't blame him. Uh, you would too. I would too. So, here he is. He's trying to be perfect. And he's sitting at the table. And we're at this table. And it's a... Uh, there's a lot of, I think this part you you got already, Ken. There's a lot of food on the table. <laughs> there's a lot of food. So there's 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 big, big bowls of potatoes, green string beans, meat, whatever we were eating that day. Uh, you know, big bowls of stuff, heavy bowls. And you got the table there. And um, 
I don't know. There was maybe it was me, Rooney, Cos, Camille, Tyson, might have been somebody else. So there's like six of us sitting around this table, and it's heavy. And Camille at one point says, "Michael, get me a spoon." Now normally you you know you go you get a spoon, but he's so wired up. And he wants to react so fast, you know, to show that, you know, he's, he's, you're going to want him in the house. He's going to be this right, this good kid. So he jumps. Now, you got to remember, he's 12 years old, going on 13. He's, he's 190 pounds of muscle. And he goes to turn to get to the cabinet for the spoon, and his leg gets gets stuck underneath, wedged underneath the table, his thigh. Mm-hmm. And, you know, strong. And he, and as he goes to turn, he picks up the whole table. And at the same time, all the food starts f- sliding down like, like, like you're on the Poseidon uh, when, when the wave <laughs> hit the boat. <laughs> and and all the food now in, in the dining area is is sliding off the table, so Camille, Camille's going nuts because it's all about you know she's a woman she doesn't want a mess oh she's screaming the, the food is gonna fall and the you know and Rudy's like saying oh I I gotta get my potatoes you know and everyone's reacting their own way me I'm sitting back and I'm watching this craziness right. Thinking to myself, <laughs> I'm the one who has to train. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta. I'm like, I'm like taking a bird's eye view at this stuff going on. I'm, and I'm watching, and everybody's reacting their own way. And what is Cus doing? Camille's yelling. Tyson's hiding his face, like he, like he did something horrendous. Like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh no. Oh, you know, like he did something, you know, uh, terrible. Right, like he just heisted the first national bank or something, <laughs> and and Cus Cus is going. Look at that power! <laughs> 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 look at the power! And look at that power! The next champ of the world! And I'm like, <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> this, is, this is crazy. Yeah, this is crazy, and I'm. And I'm going to be, this is a crazy ship over here. <laughs> and I'm going to be freaking steering the the boat. <laughs> Holy <laughs> cow. What the, f- you know, I, I I thought about, you ever see that movie with uh, Jack Nicholson, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? Oh, yeah. And Rob's yep. going to get it up. Rob's going to get it up for us. I, I mean, I, I felt like I was, I felt a little bit like that. I was Jack Nicholas, yeah. and I was in one flew over the cuckoo's nest, you know, and and they <laughs> yeah. and, and they're all getting on this boat. They're, they're all getting on this boat. All these guys from this this crazy asylum, you know, and <laughs> but they all have their all beautiful little ways. Every one of them can, you know, yeah. And and they were misunderstood. They were they they nobody ever let them really be, you know, have a chance for life, and uh, they were. And then Jack Nicholas came along and and you know liberated them for a couple of minutes, but I want I got to tell you since we're on food I got to tell you one st- other story. Cuz had a fear of planes. I don't know if you knew that, but he he always he was afraid of flying. He would not fly. And back in those days, it was a problem a little bit because he had the heavyweight champ of the world and. If he was, you know, if he was fighting in Europe or, uh, or if there was some, you know, I mean, you had to get on a, for the most part, you had to get on a plane. But no, Cuz would get on a ship. <laughs> he he would, he would get on his ship. He he'd leave a couple weeks early, and and meet you, and 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 meet you there. So he was, there was his, he was in Europe. I'm trying to remember what. Fighter was for, um, what it was, if it was a Patterson fight? It must have been a Patterson fight. He was in London. I know it was London. Yeah. But he was telling me the story. He's over there, and 
the ship liners went on strike. Something happened where he couldn't get back. Now he's stuck a month. <laughs> you know, I don't know if it was a month, but let's just say a long time. He's stuck over there in in freaking, you know, over in London. Where, as you know, they got darts. They got snooker. <laughs> <laughs> Ken. Ken, they do. You know? Yeah. And because cuz didn't really want to go to pubs and play darts, you know? Uh, and they know... I love my people in London. I love yous. My brothers, my sisters over there, I love yous, boxing fans. Um, so he's stuck over there. So he's over there. He's, he's a manager. He's famous. He wears a bowler hat. He's got class cuz. He's special. He stands out. He's wearing a bowler hat, and he's staying in the best hotel in London, and he's he's bored. So each day he's bought and he's and he starts getting a a a desire. What do you call it? A um a craving. A, a craving. He's got a craving. You ready? He's a got a craving for an American Frankfurter. <laughs> he's got uh, and he's telling me, you know, because me and him talk every day. He says, "Teddy, I had this crave and I couldn't get it out of my head. I started imagining it." thinking about it that a uh, uh, Nathan's Frankfurter mm -hmm. would would mustard right American must so and on a roll it's got to be a Nathan's it's got to be an American and they don't have that kind of food over there so now he goes and he starts looking around for it and everywhere like he sees of whatever he goes give me a hot and he, goes, he takes the hot dog and he bites it and, bah, bah, and he spits it out because it's it's not the right it's not an American hot dog. So he goes everywhere. He goes into the restaurants. He goes on the street vendors. Whatever they have back in those days, he goes and he's tried like twenty different places. And he's 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 beaten down. He's beaten <laughs> down because he, every one of them failed him. Ken, they all came up short, and now the craving has gotten worse. <laughs> <laughs> because now it's out of control. So now he puts out an award, an award, a cash award of $500 to any busboy that can bring him an American hot dog. <laughs> so people that need their bags, any busboy, any bellhop, so people that need their bags taken to, they ain't getting their bags taken. All the bellhops out on the street looking for an American Frankfurter. <laughs> because they're going to get $500 cash. American money. So they're all out. So everybody's out there searching for an American Frankfurter. And they're bringing them back. They bring back, here, here's a, no, 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 no good. <laughs> and then one after another, he's rejecting. One of me told me, was was good, was pretty good, pretty good, until he put the relish. You got to have relish, cuss like relish. Until you put the, that was part of the deal. You don't get your 500 without the mustard and the relish. He put the relish on, duh, ruined the whole thing. It was too much <laughs> sugar. It was too sugary. Uh, it was no good. That's funny. <laughs> Before I feel like we could tell you, we I could listen to these stories all day. But bef I, a couple of things I want to get to before we end this one, and is uh, some of the mental insights of fighting psychology that you learned from from Cuss. Like, talk to me about some of the mental aspects that he would go over with you that you would eventually pass on to some of your own fighters. Like, uh, you know, you 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 famously um, say all the time that fighting is 75, 80 percent of it m mental. Talk to me about some of the things you learned from Cuss in that regard. Well, I mean, the psychology, the psychological landscape of a person, forget a fighter, a person. Everyone's afraid. A lot of people think because they're fighters, they they don't have that gene, that 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 mechanism, that trait. Of course you have it. Unless you came in on a spaceship, you you have it. Nature, God put it there for a reason, to prepare you for something that's difficult, dangerous, that you need to be ready. And uh, so the first thing was understanding that, understanding that and 
Cuz had a saying, fear is like fire. If you learn how to control it, it's going to cook for you. It's going to heat your homes. It's going to fuel different, you know, mechanisms. Uh, if you don't, it's going to consume you and everything around you. Basically, burn you down. Burn your house down. So, you know, it, it was... It was about no matter how good you are physically, no matter how good you are as a teacher, Teddy Atlas, you have to help the person in the psychological arena because they won't be able to take those that knowledge, those physical traits, and be able to use them in the arena that you want them to use them because... The mental side will hold them back. You know, he used to say to me, how hard is it you're teaching a guy to slip a punch? So everything from here down, this is the real way to teach. It's like a spike has to be through your head, down here, so when you move, you don't leave your head on the side. A lot of people do that. You want to be really do it right? It's all got to move one piece, one piece. So nothing is left behind where you get hit on the side. All right, and you... But when when the how hard is it to make that physical move? Punch comes, bop, punch, bop. It's not hard. You don't have to be an athlete, but it's hard to do when the threat of being hit is injected into the equation. It's not the physical act that's hard. It's the thought of where you're doing it, under what circumstances you're doing it, and what threat. Is part of those circumstances. So now you're doing that simple act with the threat of a punch. What happens? I do. Try it. Go ahead, uh, beautiful <laughs> fans. Try it. Get somebody up. Put them in front of you. Open your hands so you don't hit them hard. And have them slip over perfectly straight and throw the punch at them. See if they do it. No. See if they do this, they close their eyes, they flinch. So I, that's the simplest form of explanation I just gave you, baby steps. But then it advances from there that everything is attached to the mental state, to the controlling of fear, to how good you become, how How could you become at controlling, at taming that lion, which is fear? You know, to what level you you get to. You want to get a fighter to where he can be comfortable in an uncomfortable environment. In an environment that for everyone else is what it should be. It's fire. It's chaos. It's, it's everything going so fast. But what's really going fast is your fear, your your lack of control over the moment that is allowing things to appear that way. Yeah. You know, it's 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 a matter of you know being able to I'll give you an example. Now this is on my own, but I one time Cuss and me are watching a fight and Cuss was like, That's why you're gonna be a good trainer. I'm watching a fight, and it's a bit of a slugfest, and the other guy is missing all these punches. And the commentators are saying, oh, he's missing the punches. And I'm watching, and Cuz says, what do you see, Teddy? And I said, you see the guy making a miss? Like they're implying? I said, no. The guy's head ain't even moving. <laughs> It's it's like that old saying that you couldn't miss. It'd be like missing the side of a barn. Like he, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like he's as easy to hit as the side of a barn. The guy's head was right there. You couldn't miss him. Yet the punches from the opponent were going here, 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 and the announcers are talking, uh, talking like this guy's Pinel Whitaker. <laughs> uh, you know, like he's uh, like he's like <laughs> like like he's like he's Floyd Mayweather. I mean. And and I'm watching it because says, Teddy, before I break this TV set and smash this audio 
because Gus would get nuts. He goes, tell me what you're seeing. And I said, I'm seeing a guy that's missing. Why is he missing? I said, because the guy's moving, making it I said, no. Well, why is he missing? Because he has bad aim? I said, no. I said, because he's excited. Because he's scared. Because he's not in control. So he's just throwing punches without looking, without seeing, without directing. Because he's out of control. Yeah. And that's every day of my life because it was about becoming more in control. It was about the more you can become in control. You could take a guy, let's say talent from 1 to 10, 10 being the best. You got a guy with 10 talent. Now you got a guy with 6. I'm pushing it, but I'm going to say 6. You teach him, you make his talent better because you're a good teacher. And you bring it up to a 8. But if you make him mentally what you need to make him, what we're talking about, and I could talk about it for two and a half weeks and still be talking about it, but if you make him what you have to make him, a real pro, a guy who's not influenced by any of these outside weaknesses, sources, influences, if you make them that, and there's very few people out there understanding that, Ken, but if you make them that, you could take this guy that was a six against this guy that's a 10, you beat him every day twice on Sunday because you will be using every bit of your ability where he'll be using a small, minute part of it because he's excited. That that leads me into my next question, and that's regarding the peekaboo style that um, a lot of fans ask about this when we ask them to submit questions uh, regarding Cuss in particular. Is um, that it? Was that the premise for the peekaboo style, knowing that the other guy would be amped up, a little bit nervous, or a lot nervous, and you'd use that energy against him to kind of bob and weave using that peekaboo style so the guy's throwing a lot of punches, getting himself tired before you come back and, and, and start to answer the punches? Not really. It was devi devised on a system, a technology, a belief, a practice, a formula of good habits, of rules, regulations and habits, rules that you, first of all, he wanted to create somebody that could be efficient both defensively and offensively. And he wanted to work off both ends. He wanted the defense to be able to supply the offense and the offense to work within a responsible defensive understanding and formula. He wanted to be able to get it from both sides. He wanted you to be able to lead and create offense and also counterpunch. And again, allow your offense to have a starting point on its own and allow your defense to also be able to introduce offense into this system. He wanted you to be responsibly defensively and offensively. He didn't want anything wasted. He didn't want you giving up defense for offense. He didn't want you throwing punches that were too fat, too irresponsible. He wanted everything to be done with a meaning, a purpose. And he wanted to design a style that while doing all the things I just said, that were checking the boxes on responsibility for defense, on being as efficient offensively as possible, uh, as creative, uh, as, with, without, as I said, without waste, um, effective, all those things, he wanted to do it in an exciting form because he wanted you to make money. Because it was mm -hmm. an entertainment business. It wasn't good enough if you did this and you stunk to join out. You, <laughs> you could be effective and efficient doing it that way. Fighters do. 
but then people wouldn't pay to watch your fighter. He wanted to do all of this and have people saying, I can't wait to see him again. Mm -hmm. He wanted to take care of the business side and the athletic side and the sports side, the professional side. And he came up with the peekaboo to do this, that you would get your hands up in a close crouch right underneath your eyes. Why underneath your eyes? You see guys like this. You block your peripheral vision. Here, you can see them coming on the side. Here, you lose that. So little things like that, shin down, look up with your eyes, look at the chest and shoulder area. Mental, technical, physical. What, Teddy, just looking at the chest? Yes, because by keeping your chin protected, where now you're less vulnerable to that area that could be susceptible, you're looking only at the chest area. Now you can keep, if you have to pick your head up, if you have to look at the head, you have to pick your head up and you expose yourself. And by staying down here, you're looking at only what makes sense to look at. You don't have to see the head. Like Cus used to tell me, if if his head's not there, then get out of the ring. <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> you're fighting a headless guy. Get out. <laughs> he goes, you don't have to see his head to hit it. You know it's attached to his shoulders. Bang, you hit it. You don't have to pick your head up and expose your chin to see it. Also, what do you eliminate when you're not looking right into his face? The emotional side. It's not emotional. It's not about the guy showing you he's he's not bothered or he's trying to intimidate you. You're not even into all that. You're just seeing what has to be seen. Flesh and blood. It's just a job. It's cold. It's cold. Calculating. Efficient. It's professional. So you're just seeing what you have to see. You don't expose. You can hit it. And you're seeing here where you can see the punches coming. Gus used to tell me, Teddy, if you could get your fighter really calm, here see a twitch in the muscle before the jab comes. <laughs> here see a little contraction. He doesn't even know he's seen it. Well, why did he move? Why was he so good? Why was Ali so good? Why were certain guys so good? They saw something. They were calm enough. Yeah, they had great reflexes. Yeah, great timing. But why? It wasn't just the genetics. Yeah, the speed was their genetics. Yes, yes. But being calm enough, ast astute enough to be able to, that was part of this, getting to that place. Cus said, you want to, it doesn't happen, but you want to get your fighter to the point of relaxation where he's sitting outside the ring watching himself perform. Mm -hmm. That's what you're trying to do. So, and again, the, the physical, technical approach of it, makeup of, hands up, chin down, waist nothing. Punch comes from your chin, right to the target, straight back. Cover straight back fast. Don't don't leave anything out there where something could get in. Get it back real quick. You throw this hand, this hand's up. You throw this hand, this hand's up. The hand doesn't come back this way. It comes straight back. Nothing wasted. Nothing ventured to a bad place. Your last punch, you move your head. Because when you're punching, like Cus would say to me, Teddy, this guy's got a terrible habit of punching back. <laughs> I hate that. I hate that. They punch back. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> so after your last punch, move somewhere. Move. Here, yeah, little thing, little thing. We're teaching people right now. Little thing. Boom, I move. Did I move? Yes, right? Ken, boom. Did I move? Yes. I moved too late. Why? I waited for my hand to cover before I moved. You don't wait. You don't wait. If you're robbing a bank and a getaway guy starts moving, do you wait to get in the getaway? He waits, and then you get there, and then you go? No. You tell the getaway guy, start going. I'll meet you on 14th Street. <laughs> and you start moving. You jump in the car. You're ahead. Well, same thing. I don't wait for the hand to come. I go, boom. I let the hand meet me. Boom. I let the hand meet me to where I'm going to be. Everything was figured out. Every single thing was figured out. Everything. Feet. Every. I'm not going to go into any more. I taught you guys enough. <laughs> but but there was a system. 
And you know, I, I was, it was, it was poured. You know how you pour cement into a, into a, into an opening to build a, a house, a foundation. It was poured into my head. Mm-hmm. But then, Cuz said, "You have a, you're gonna figure things out yourself." And I did. I started to change things. Like for certain guys, it didn't make sense to do that. Like I had a tall guy, and everyone thought, "Oh, you're gonna teach him custom auto pickup?" No, I'm not. Guy's six foot eight. What am I gonna teach him that for? I'm gonna teach him a control range. So I knew what to keep and what to change and what to make adjustments with. You you follow, Ken? Yeah. It didn't make sense with a six foot eight guy to allow a guy to get in close where you're slipping punches. I'd rather control range and never let him get into that geography. Why would I do that? But then someone like Kevin Rooney, and it's not knocking him, but he was so locked into only that and a few of the other guys up there. But there's nobody left. There's only me. But some of those guys, they would get locked into thinking it had to be always that way. No. No, there had to be some adaptation, some thinking to what made sense. With Tyson, it all made sense. He was the perfect guy for that. Perfect guy for that. It made sense. But for me, over the years, I I adapted to things that make sense for that individual. What his strengths are, what they're not. What his physical attributes are, what they're not. I feel like we could talk about this stuff forever, like uh, Muhammad Ali calling the house and some of the people that would come up. You know what it was like to pick up the phone? Uh, Hello? Oh, how is this? This is Muhammad Ali. (laughs) Is the old man there? (laughs) Put the old man on. (laughs) Tell him, put the old man on the phone. (laughs) Tell him, Joe Frazier's Frazier's so ugly, and he cries. His tears see his face. They want to crawl back into his eyes. (laughs) Now put the old man. (laughs) I'd I'd be walking around saying, I just talked to my... uh, I just I mean, cousin would say, "Give me the phone." <laughs> hey, mom. And I say, "That's that's that's what." That's what. Cousin be off. And what about some of the people that would come up to see see the uh, training facility and meet with Cus? Like I think you mentioned Norman Mailer and some other guys. All kinds of guys. You never knew who was going to show up. Norman Mailer, one of the greatest writers of. I don't know of our time for sure, um, but a nut, a nut, <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a nut. But you know, uh, he 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 would show up. He loved cuss, and he'd show up, and they they'd start talking, they'd start talking some outer space stuff. Let me tell you, <laughs> uh, you know, I I'd, I'd, I'd get up, I say, listen, I I got I got I got to get out of here for a minute. You know, <laughs> just just for a minute. I mean, I know I'm yeah. not up to you guys' stature, but uh, I know when I'm listening to something a little crazy, I'm I'm getting out of here. I'm gonna, yeah. uh, you know, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> but um, he would. I mean, he would come up there. Uh, Cus was a guy. He was a stubborn son of a gun. Oh God, you know he was stubborn. He used to tell me, you know, I'm Calabrese, a Calabrese thick-headed. He goes, I said, yeah. He goes, no, I mean, really thick-headed. I'm, I'm, I had to think. I said, All right, that's that's really thick-headed, you know. But, uh, I mean, he went through so many different things. I I mean, I remember when he was, he told me, he would tell me stories, you know, sit out, come on, we're going to talk. And he started telling me about the IBC when he was fighting the IBC, Ken. He didn't trust the cops. He didn't trust anybody because he felt that they had everyone on the payroll. And I'm sure they did. Yeah. You know, I'm sure some of it got pushed a little, but I'm sure they did. Writers, everybody, and he had to really, he had to be thinking of things that people thought he was crazy and paranoid. But, you know, what's that old saying? You know, uh even though uh, just because I'm paranoid don't mean there ain't somebody out to get me, right? I mean, <laughs> he, That's for sure. You know, he uh, told me, he said, when he went out, he would pin his he would pin his pockets together with pins. 
<laughs> with safety pins. So somebody couldn't, so a cop or a person, whatever, couldn't plant something on them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just telling I thought you were going to say, so someone couldn't steal something from no, him. He no, no. He didn't want someone to put something in his pockets. <laughs> that that he could, next thing you know, he gets pulled over. Or he gets, hey, let, you know, we got a report. We got to frisk you. Oh, where'd you get this? You know. <laughs> so, I mean, he, you know, I, I could go on. I'm giving you this. I'm giving you this. Yeah. Uh, out of this. I mean, I could go on. For 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 days, for days. <laughs> you wanna you wanna hear uh, again? It's with love, but you wanna hear one yeah. story. This yeah. one more story. We're in a we're in. He's telling me this story. He owned the Gramercy Gym, Fourteenth Street, and it, it was a great gym. It's not there no more. Shame. What a great gym. And when when I started training fighters for him, when I needed sparring, he'd call up the guys that he gave to Jim to, Bob Jackson, our guy. My man Teddy's coming down. Take care of him. All right, cuss. You know, and I go down, I drive down, and I bring whoever I had to get sparring. We'll get them sparring. Don't worry. And you, you had the pros. You had to go up three flights of steps. And it was three, and he loved it. And you know what? You had to go up three big flights of steps, Ken. You went up the first, boom. You went up the first, boom. Then the second, you're in the middle. Then the next. And he said that if a fighter, when they opened that door, a young kid, a young aspiring fighter, he knew right away if they were going to make it. Just when they opened the door. Right away. You know how? He said, Teddy, because during that travel, he goes, there's a lot going through your mind. He said, a lot going. And he said, by the time you each bit of the journey, journey, steps, but each bit of the when you got up to that middle, you could hear something, that first flight, not the middle. By the time you got to the middle, you could, it was more clear what you were hearing. You're hearing the speed back. You're, you're hearing the, you know, you're, you're hearing some yelling going on. You're hearing the skipping rope. You're hitting the heavy back. You're, you're getting told what you're getting closer to. By the time you got to the top level, and it was a big metal door, intimidating, nothing was in an accident in Cuss's world. You get to the top, now you heard everything. You heard the grunting from the body shots. You heard the yelling from the corner. You heard the, the bells ringing. You heard everything. You knew where you were about to go. Now you had to open up a heavy door. You didn't just open it with two fingers. He said when that door flung open finally after all that, if the guy was with a father or a friend, the guy wasn't making it because he needed them to go up that, that, those, through that journey. But if the guy opened it up by himself, I might have a fighter. Interesting. And and just just so you know what I mean? Just things like that. You know, and um so anyway, one time he's fighting the IPC, he's going through this whole thing and he told me he hadn't slept for three days. I'm just telling you what he told me. <laughs> Maybe he slept yeah. a few hours. You know, people say I didn't sleep for three days. Maybe that means they slept two hours here, an hour here, whatever, whatever. So and he's on a he's basically on a on a hideout almost from people that are after me thinks and whatever. So he's under stress. He's under stress. So it's about it's about maybe three two two, three three o'clock in the morning and he's standing now the this old landmark gym, it had all it all it had all the, the wooden floors, the parquet floors it had a ring, and then in the back it had a small ring. And it had the locker rooms, and, the, and it had open windows, big open windows facing 14th Street right there in New York. And it's facing 14th and Irving, and it's facing the Con Edison building. Well, anyone who knows mm -hmm. what the Con Edison building is, they know that there's a clock there, a big clock, part of the Con Edison building. So Cus is 
this is his life. This is his place. So he's there. It's it's three in the morning, somewhere in that vicinity. He hasn't slept for three days. He's got all this stuff going on, and he's walking back and forth, and he's and he's trying to think things out. He's trying to figure out what his next move is with the IBC. There's room out there that there's a, they're looking to kill him. All this stuff going on. And he's trying to figure out his next move. And he's walking back and forth. It's 3 o'clock. He looks at the clock. He sees it's 3 o'clock. He turns around. He walks a few steps, right? He turns around. He looks again. It's 3.20. He just walked. He just walked a couple of steps. He turned around. 20 minutes went by. What's going on? Am I hallucinating? I got to go. This is Customato now. I got to get control of my faculties. I, I'm I got to get control of everything now. Am, am I, what is going on here? There's got to be an explanation. Now, only Cuss would do it this way. He breaks everything down systematically. He, t- he goes... All right, I turned around, I turned around, and all right, let me try this again. Turns around, he walks, this time he counts his step again. He counts them. He counts his steps. He counts, I think he told me, 10 steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Turns around. Now it's 340. <laughs> Wait a minute. Does it again. Turns around. Turns around. It's four o'clock. What the hell is going on? I walk 10 steps. 20 minutes go by. (laughs) What's going on? I got to clear my head. I got to think. I haven't been. I haven't slept for three days. I got all this stuff going on. Have they put something in my drink when I didn't realize it? <laughs> I got to figure this out. I got to figure it out. And cuz the calculating, with all this going on, I'll be damned if this, whatever it is, is going to control me. Get myself together. Turn around. One, two, three, four, five. Whoop! I, in the fifth step, turns. he said, I... Turn around real quick. And I look. They're cleaning the clock. (laughs) They're cleaning the clock. (laughs) You know, it was, uh, but this is a guy that, you know, I mean, at the time when the sport was the biggest sport in the world, he made Floyd Patterson a guy who was a middleweight moved him up to all his fights. Most of his fights on the way up was middleweight, mm-hmm. Olympic gold medalist. But he moved him to heavyweight. You know, in those days, heavyweights were one eighty. You know, whatever. He moved him into heavyweight, heavyweight championship of the world. You know, first youngest heavyweight champ of the world until Tyson broke it, and the first that ever. Heavyweight champ to lose the title and regain it. Nobody had ever done that. He did it against Egomar Johansson from Sweden. Oh, Sweden. That, that reminds me of the time that you trained the 1980 Swedish Olympic team. I trained the <laughs> 1980 Swedish Olympic team. That was the year that Jimmy Carter, the president of the United States, decided we were not going to send an Olympic team because of what was going on with Russia. Yeah. So... Being that we didn't have an Olympic team, um, I'm sitting watching ABC Wild Water Sports boxing. Mm-hmm. Amateurs back in those days, the amateur tournaments boxing on well on TV, and it was big. Not like today, it was big. It meant something. So you had you remember those fights? I don't know if you remember, Ken, but uh, I mean, you would have the U.S. fighting the Soviet Union, U.S. fighting. Cuba or whatever. The U.S. fight, you know, Ireland. Yeah. The U.S. fighting London, uh, you know, uh, you know, Britain. England, Great Britain. So this particular, f- we're watching, and it's the U.S. team or, or one of their teams. They had several teams, you know, uh, 
on ABC Wild World of Sports fighting the Swedish team. And it's the heavyweights. Jimmy Clark is the heavyweight representative, one of the top guys in the U.S. He didn't make the Olympic team, I don't think. I don't think so. But anyway, he's fighting a guy named Anders Eklund. And he's a Swedish heavyweight. Now, I'm watching a fight. Clark's got more experience. He's, you know, he's, he's a better fighter. He's more fluid, more athletic, you know, technically better. But Eklund is this big six foot seven giant, but too stiff and good right hand puncher. You know, and he's fighting Jimmy and it's a close fight. I think he might have dropped Clark. I don't remember. I don't remember. But it's a close competitive fight, and this guy, you can see, doesn't know a lot. I decide to go get cuss. You know, interrupted him making tuna sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with love, with love, with love. Somebody will be poking these things at me maybe someday if I'm, if I'm, if I was ever lucky enough to become half the, the legend of him. So I say it the right way. So anyway, uh, I go get Cuss. Cuss, come here. I want to show you something. What do you like? What do you got, Ted? What do you got, Teddy Atlas? You know, he sometimes he call me Teddy Atlas or Atlas. So uh, what do you got? I said I want you to see this fight. You got fights on? You're not watching that that thing with that funny ball. <laughs> no, I'm not watching football. No, I'm watching a fight. All right. Come in. It's heavyweight. And uh, three rounds. I said, what do you see? I said, well, I see a guy that can't fight, hasn't been taught that much. I don't know. Big, strong guy. But, you know, he, he's basics, but a little too basic at this level. And I uh, was fighting Jimmy Clark, more experienced. And it's, I forget who they gave the decision to. It didn't really matter. And I, he said, well, what is, what is it? What do you want to tell me? Uh, I took, you know, cuss the model I'm with. You know what I mean, Ken? Yeah. So I said to him, I'd like to train that guy. You want to train him? I said, yeah, I'd like to train that guy, see if I, I think I could make him maybe a, a really uh, interesting fighter. You know, and he's, he's just a raw piece of clay. Big, strong guy, sh showed some guts, fighting a guy that's more experienced. He said, you want to train him? Hold on a minute. Hello, James Leslie. That's what he called Jimmy Jacobs. That was his middle name. Yeah. They were very close. They lived yeah. together 15 years in Manhattan. James. Yes, yes, cuz. Listen, my man here. Told you he's going to be the best, you know, of course. You know, he's got his, you know, whatever. Trainer, yeah. Hey, Teddy Atlas. Yeah, how's Teddy doing? Good. Listen, he's just watching this. You watching this uh, amateur show on ABC? Yes, I am. He'd like to train that guy. <laughs> All right, let me make a couple phone calls. I don't know. The next day? <laughs> yeah. Listen, they're going to they're gonna fly in. And stay for a, mo uh, a month or three weeks, whatever it was. And you're going to... Uh, yeah, you're going to train. You said you want to train them. Jimmy contacted them, you, you know. And you got to remember, I had contacts in Sweden, too. But, I, you know, you never think... He goes, we fought Igor Mario Hansen. Jimmy has contacts with the film business. Whatever the contacts were, made a phone call to the... Somebody in the government got in touch with somebody in the Olympic team. Somebody here, blah, 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 blah. Bada bing, bada bang, boom, boom. <laughs> like Tony Soprano would say, bada bing. And he's coming in next Monday. He comes in. I train him. Comes in with one of his trainers. And he says... The only thing is we have to agree to let the trainer. We never wanted the trainers to come because, you know, we're yeah. training them. We're, we don't want interference. I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm being very honest. And, um, but they 
didn't want to let go. They said, no, we want to go. So they said the only deal is that uh, he, the trainer, I don't know if it was one or two trainers, I think one, has to come with him. And he wants to learn too. So Teddy will be teaching him. He'll be learning something with him, whatever. All right, that's the deal. That's the deal. They come, I train them. The three weeks is, we train. Gonna get the Olympics are coming up. He's gonna train with me for the Olympics. I'm gonna train him for the Olympic Games, and that's gonna be one of the guys I'm training. All of a sudden, a problem. There's a rule that the Olympic Committee or whatever they have in Sweden that the team must, and it makes sense, I get it, the team must train together. We did, uh, We had the same rules. The team has to train together. You can't have one guy separate from the rest of the team, especially the heavyweight. So he's got to train together. So I said, oh, so there goes that. That's the end of that. He goes, no, 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 no. The whole Swedish team, they're very happy with the way you trained them. He told the other coaches, the whole team's coming. You're training the whole team. <laughs> <laughs> I said, wait, because oh, I, I, I didn't really ask for a whole team. I asked for a little part of it, you know, a big part, a heavyweight. But no, no, Teddy, you're going to train the whole team. The whole team's coming. <laughs> I trained the Swedish Olympic team. They did better. Look, I, I'm not going to go and do this stupid stuff, but they did better than ex than projected. The Swedish team wasn't exactly the Cubans. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Ken? Yeah. But They were like the Cuban uh, <laughs> ski jumping team. No, no the <laughs> Tobago team. The, the, yeah. the, the, uh, the, the bobsled. 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 Yeah. Bobsled. The Jamaican bobsled team. Um. They made a movie, a great movie, funny movie. Listen, they did better than projected. Actually, a lot better. I think one of them got a bronze medal, if I remember correct, I think, which was not expected. Mm -hmm. Not expected. Um. Anyway, that was, it was quite an experience, part of my, you know, learning, part of what I went through, Yeah. you know. No, that's a good one. Well, listen, we could talk about these stories all day as far as I'm concerned, but I know that... Um, I hope that people enjoy it. I hope I hope they enjoy it. I really do. I hope... If they do, I hope they send us more questions and send some comments and uh, happy to keep doing these. I mean, we're in quarantine, so we're looking for stuff to talk about and, and preferably stuff that people are interested in, obviously. I'd so, love to have uh, a contest where we pick out the best question and whoever wins gets to to drive in one of your Lamborghinis. No problem. I mean, and he chooses the color. No problem. Uh, he chooses whether or not the roof is up or down. <laughs> no problem there. All he has to do is come to L.A. Well, listen, Teddy, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thank you. I hope the fans enjoy it. I think they will. And um, with that, is there anything that we missed that you'd like to add no. in? I could go right. on. And on and on. You know, I spent a piece of my life with Cuss and it's still with me, you know? Yeah. But uh, hopefully, you know, like I said earlier, kidding around but very serious. I, I, I'd have to talk for, I'd have to be like one of these guys that come in from the from the cold back in the days with the, right? <laughs> Brought them in from the cold, right? Yeah. And we got to debrief them for how long is it going to take? It's going to take about a month. It's going to take about a month. <laughs> That's what it would take. You know, well, listen, if you do like the stories, um, you can check out Teddy's audio book. There's a lot more in-depth commentary about the time with Cuss, as well as a whole host of other topics. Atlas, A Son's Journey to Become a Man. You can find it in uh, audible.com, amazon.com, wherever you get your audio books and printed books. And uh, with that, stay safe, everyone. It's been a pleasure being with you, Teddy. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back. Take care, guys. Take care, Tom.